All right, everybody. I think we should make a start. Um, very, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Mandu Reid. I'm the leader of the Women's Equality Party. We are the UK's first and only feminist political party, and we exist because none of the other political parties and, and most politicians, frankly, are nowhere near ambitious enough about equality between men and women. So we're here to fill that gap. Um, this is the first of a series of events that I'll be hosting. And the intention really is to examine, to explore, to discuss topics that affect women's lives in the UK and globally. And often there's a, a massive overlap between what affects women in the UK and what affects women globally. Um, we'll always have special guests in the mix and, and those are typically gonna be people whose tireless work on the front lines or behind the scenes um, doesn't get anything close to enough attention or no, nowhere near the airtime it deserves. Uh, tonight, I'm joined by two brilliant women, uh, Ruth Taylor and uh, Rachel Clark. And uh, you'll hear more from them and about them in a moment. Uh, but our topic tonight, as, as I presume you know, is how women's rights, women's reproductive rights um, are under threat in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, with, a, with a focus really on abortion rights and abortion access. Uh, we will begin by getting to know our guests and their work, and then we'll have a conversation um, inspired by some of the questions people have submitted to the WEP team in advance of this evening. You'll be able to interact with each other, and please do, um, on the chat where you can also comment on what's being said, and um, please feel free as well to post um, questions. Um, we won't be able to answer all of them, but we'll pick a few of them and, 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 and um, address those at the end of the session. Um, the session's being recorded, and that's really uh, just so that it can be shared afterwards with people who weren't able to make it uh, here and now, live and direct tonight. Um, at 8 p.m., we're gonna have a 10-minute interlude. And the purpose of that really is to give people who want to, to um, clap for carers, um, and have a comfort break and also for the team to um, identify which of the questions we'll uh, pick up to close the session off um, at, from 10 past eight. So please do come back at, at 10 past eight so we can round off with your questions. Um, and like I said, it's the chat function, um, which is the way you can submit the questions that you uh, want us to consider looking at. Uh, before we get going though, Let's just pause for a moment and, and, and let's reflect and consider the backdrop, which is the pandemic that we're all in, in the mix of, that we're all mired in right now. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will have heard the COVID-19 crisis being hailed by some, and I think these are very tone deaf people, by, by some people as the great leveler, a notion which thankfully was powerfully debunked by Emily Maitlis. It doesn't surprise me at all that it, it took a woman uh, in the media to debunk that. Um, and she did really powerfully, really eloquently last week in her opening remarks ahead of um, a Newsnight segment that she fronted last week. Now the way I see it, rather than being a great leveler, this COVID-19 is actually more of a great revealer. It's shown instead that we are far from all equal. It's shown instead that the level playing field people are imagining when they're referring to it as a great leveler is, is total fantasy, a complete myth. In fact, I think it's brought into even sharper focus how deeply unequal our society is. And it's already exposed how vulnerable we all are when those who need support most are denied it. And, and when I say support, I'm talking about all manner of things. I'm talking about a living wage. I'm talking about safe in, a safe working environment, freedom from the threat of violence, and, and among many other things, healthcare. Now abortions and reproductive services are healthcare. So the attempts to erode those rights and, the, and access to those things are a really grave threat indeed. So this great revealer has also shown quite disturbingly how fragile some of the gains we've made in this space 
uh, actually are across the world. So right here in the UK, Poland, the USA, we've seen how there have been moves by the authorities to, to undermine or um, dodge uh, some of the, the hard fought games that, that we've made over the, over the last few decades in this space. And that's why you know, so much of the work that so many of us are doing is as urgent and as important as it's ever been. And that's exactly why we are gathered here this evening and that's exactly what we're, we're gonna discuss. So um, I think that sets the scene and, and, and now, well, with no further kind of dither and delay, let's get on with it. Um, first thing, I, I would love to take a moment now to introduce Rachel and Ruth, um, starting with you, Ruth, uh, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, a little bit about your organization, what it does and why it matters. Hi, Mandu. Hello, everyone. This is uh, really exciting. I'm really uh, happy to be here um, on this lovely Thursday evening. Um, my name is Ruth Taylor and I'm Chief Exec of Abortion Support Network. Um, I have been a feminist ever since I was a small child and my mum had a t-shirt from an organisation called Womankind Worldwide and I asked her what it meant and she told me um, it meant uh, that there were people who were working for equality all around the world because women weren't treated equally to men. So ever since I was about four I've carried that with me. Um, so it's really exciting to be here um, on this call with lots of other people who I think believe the same thing. Um, and I've worked for Abortion Support Network since the beginning of 2018 as Chief Exec. Um, we've been going since 2009. We were set up because we believe that I can't afford an abortion shouldn't be the main reason that someone becomes a parent. So since 2009, we've been contacted by well over 5,000 people um, who have needed support in working out how to access an abortion that they should be able to get at home. We were set up to support people originally in Ireland, Northern Ireland and the Isle of Man. Um, and then last year, we expanded our service to support people living in Malta and Gibraltar. And then in December, we launched a service called Abortion Without Borders, uh, which is for people who live in Poland. So we run a helpline and we provide non-judgmental information, advice and support to people who want to access an abortion. Um, we provide financial support when people need it and we signpost people to where they can access safe but illegal pills online. So um, that's ASN um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I'm really happy to be here um, and it's uh, amazing to be getting this platform um, during such a difficult time for people who, you know, uh, People who need abortions at the moment, we're hearing stories from women who are um, living already in desperate situations and it's just been made worse by the coronavirus. So um, it's good to be shining a light on this at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, over to you, Rachel. Hi, uh, so I'm Rachel. I work for the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. Uh, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service has been around since 1968, which is when abortions first became legal in Great Britain. Uh, we started because in Birmingham, uh, the lead gynaecologist for the whole city decided that no matter what the law was around abortion, he provided abortions. So women who were legally entitled to receive care weren't able to get to that care on the NHS. So we started as a charity. Um, at that point, we were providing care that wasn't funded by the NHS, but we were providing it at cost to women that needed care. Um, and this has carried on to the present day. Uh, we treat about 100,000 people a year. Uh, that is about, we, once, once we've included all the other people, so we do vasectomies as well. There are some uh, women who, when they come to see us, opt not to proceed. Um, once we've done that, we do about a third of all abortions in the UK. So uh, we see, you know, about uh, tens of thousands of women every year who really are just keen to discuss their options for their pregnancies and talk about ending them. And uh, what my team does is advocate for those women. So we're really here to talk about what their needs are, because 
quite often the people that come to us aren't able really to talk publicly about what it is that they want. They don't feel that it's something that they can discuss outside their family, outside their friends. Obviously, quite often they, they don't want to put their names or their faces to things. So it's really our job to make clear what it is that they need uh, to ensure that they can get the care that they need. And um, just, just to both of you, before we kind of dive into the, the circumstances that we're grappling with, 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 with the crisis, um, in your experience of working for your respective organizations so far, I mean, if you were to try and distill why the work you do is so important and why it matters, what would you say? Uh, I can go first. Yeah. Um, to me, abortion is a human right. To me, it's part of bodily autonomy and it's about um, being able to make decisions about when and if and how to have children and how to have sex and when to have sex and all of these things. And I think working for ASN for the past couple of years has just shown me that even more. Um, you know, not being able to make a fundamental decision about your own body and the direction that your own life takes is not something that anyone should be um, experiencing. And, you know, sadly, all around the world, I don't think there's anywhere that has it perfectly right on women's reproductive rights and health. And I think it's because, largely because of the patriarchy. Um, and I think just this point to me about if you can't make a decision about your body, then you are still being treated as lesser than. And that's the problem. Um, Rachel, anything you wanna add? I mean, I feel like Ruth has covered it all, I suppose. <laughs> the, reason, the reason that we do what we do is because uh, the, most of the people we employ are nurses and midwives, and they're there because they care about women's choices. They care about being with women and supporting the choices that they want to make about their lives. And we know that more than 50% of women that access abortions are mothers already. We know that the vast majority of them are already in relationships. And I think a lot of my job is about challenging the myths that people have about women that need an access abortions. Yeah, and for me, from a very personal point of view, um, I mean, the trajectory of my life would, would have been really, really different um, six years ago when I kind of accidentally got pregnant myself um, and had to make a choice about um, whether to continue with that pregnancy or not. And I, I chose not to, and I did have an abortion. and. I am so grateful that that opportunity was, was available to me because in, in, the, in the circumstances I found myself in, um, it, it just looked like I uh, would have had to, I was at this crossroads, you know, and had all these plans and ambitions and intentions um, for my life. And there was no way, given all the other ways, society was rigged against women, expectations around who does childcare and, and making all of that work and balancing it. There's no way um, I could, you know, square that circle. And if, if that, if I lived in a country where that option wasn't available to me, I have no idea, number one, what I would have done. And number two, what uh, uh, my prospects, my trajectory um, through life would have been. So it, and I'm sure there are other people on this call who are listening in who have their own personal experiences as well that, that this will really resonate for. But now um, let's talk about, just for a change, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, what I wanna explore a little bit is how have the women in communities um, that your organization serves been affected so far? What's going on? I'll start with you, Rachel. So the way that our services usually work, um, and this I will say is primarily because of the way the law works in this country, is that women have to come to our clinics. Um, it's not really a clinical reason for that when you're early in pregnancy, if you want to opt to have uh, to, uh, pills, have a medical abortion rather than a surgical abortion. But the way that the law was written in the 1960s uh, means that women have to turn up regardless. So. The first thing that we saw when lockdown started happening was that women were getting in touch with us saying, I'm not able to leave the house. So some of that was women who are on the very vulnerable list. So women with immune deficiencies, women who had had organ transplants, women who were caring for people uh, who had those things. So obviously there were some women that really just were not legally able to access a legal abortion because they couldn't attend a clinic. Yeah. Um, there are some people as well who I think 
quite understandably didn't want to have to travel to a clinic. Some of them didn't have cars. They were being told not to use public transport. Um, abortion clinics, although there are quite a lot of them around the country, they're not as local as your local GP. So, it, you know, if you don't live in a city, odds are you're going to need a car to be able to get to a clinic. And obviously a lot of people aren't in that position, especially if you're younger or if you're in a relationship where you don't want to know, you don't want to tell somebody that you're having an abortion. Or if you're, I mean, people were getting in touch with saying, you know, I'm a student, I had to come home and living with my parents I don't want them to know the situation I'm in so obviously I think that made it very very difficult and we were seeing women who were saying if I can't get an abortion remotely I'm not going to be able to access care so I think for us the biggest thing was enabling women to be able to take those pills remotely um, and we did quite a lot of work behind the scenes to try and make that happen and Obviously, I think everyone will probably remember uh, that the government announced it, which we were delighted about, having expected it, yes. having worked behind the scenes, having, you know, not known all of the things that it had gone through. And then that evening, um, I, I was sent a screenshot on WhatsApp from someone going, why has this disappeared? And I was just like, I'm sure it's just a mistake. And then it turned out it really wasn't a mistake and that actually government had changed their mind on it. So it took us about a week to get back from that um, and that was quite a lot of public effort that went into that and a lot of effort behind the scenes just to try and convince them that actually what they should be doing is not worrying about the small c conservative voices in their large c conservative party but worrying more about what the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Royal College of Midwives, people like us that were advocating for women were actually saying which was abortion is legal but what you're doing is making it completely inaccessible. So what do you think went on there, though? Do you think they just kind of like put it out there because there's a sensible, logical, correct, moral reason to do so and then got a bit scared? I mean, what's 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 your without revealing things you're not allowed to reveal? What, what do you think really went down? It's I'm bad at Google. In all honesty, my my understanding, I think the first time around is that it was a bit of an internal screw up. And I think that that's completely understandable in the situation that we're in. But obviously, because of the political context that you have around abortion, I think once you've seen that sort of kick off, it makes politicians very scared to do anything about it. And I think obviously what we were expecting was for Matt Hancock to stand up and say, oh, you know what, I'm really sorry, this went through the wrong channels, the wrong person signed it off, it's okay, it's going to be done, it will be out in the next couple of days. Instead, what he did was stand up on the Wednesday in the House of Commons and say, there are no plans to change the law. And that was the point at which, you know, we all erupted from our individual living rooms going, what on <laughs> earth is going on here? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I would have said, I've said at various points, oh, I'd be able to explain what happened. But quite honestly, I have absolutely no idea. I just think that it was a, yeah, I think, I think it got screwed up from the beginning and it just got worse from there. Yeah, yeah. And um, Ruth, just back to um, the, the, the general question, how have um, the women um, and communities ASN serves been affected since the crisis started to mushroom into the situation we find ourselves in now? Yeah, good question. Um, I think we can look back and see that things really changed for our clients about a month ago, actually. Um, just over a month ago. Um, so, like I said, we support people who need to travel at the moment primarily from Ireland um, and Malta and Gibraltar and Poland. Um, so, what we saw was quite quickly things changed from the very beginning of March being quite normal. Um, it was fairly easy for people to travel. Um, we're largely supporting people to come to the UK, to go to the Netherlands and to go to Germany. Um, so the beginning of March, things were still quite simple um, nothing much was going on. I don't think anyone was expecting things, as you put it, to mushroom in quite the way that they have. Um, and actually things were, it worked out, the timing worked out quite well for us. Um, we largely support people to get abortions here in the second trimester of their pregnancy. So people who are more than 12 weeks pregnant. And that means that we'd had a big rush in sort of late February, early March because of people who'd had sex around Christmas and New Year. Um, yeah. 
yeah. our ASN's rush used to be in January, February with Christmas sex, but now it's going to be more like late February, early March. So luckily we just had a really busy time. Um, and then things started getting a lot more difficult. So um, Malta was the first of the countries that we support, support people from. Malta announced that they were ceasing travel to, I think, Spain, Switzerland, Germany, and somewhere else. And I think that was five weeks ago. And we thought, okay, they're taking it seriously. What's going to happen next? And then just over four weeks ago in Poland, um, they stopped people from, well, they stopped all planes, trains, and buses from traveling. Um, and that suddenly had quite a big impact. And also around that time, we saw a massive increase in the number of calls to our Abortion Without Borders helpline. So Abortion Without Borders is a collaborative initiative for people living in Poland. And it's delivered by us and four other organizations in Poland, Germany, and Netherlands. And um, so we saw a massive increase in the number of calls at the time that basically Poland went into their, their sort of lockdown. Um, and what it's meant is that if you're in Poland and you need an abortion, um, or if you're in Malta and you need an abortion, things have got very complicated because it's very difficult to leave and or come back. Um, so for people who are in Malta at the moment, if you're under 12 weeks pregnant, you can order safe but illegal pills from Women Help Women or Women on Web, and those are still being sent to Malta, we know that. But there's no flights into Malta, so you can leave Malta, you could leave Malta and come to the UK, but you'd have to stay here indefinitely because there's no flights back. Right. So it's a difficult situation if you're in Malta and you're over 12 weeks pregnant. In Poland, what we've found is um, it's got a lot more complicated. Same thing applies. If you're less than 12 weeks pregnant, you can still access safe but illegal pills. However, if you are more than 12 weeks pregnant and you want to come to the UK or the Netherlands, you're going to have to probably do a multi-day journey um, and take multiple modes of transport. Um, so... If you want to leave Poland and go to Germany, you have basically have to leave Poland and go to Germany and you have to do that in a private car. So we had a client um, a few weeks ago who um, had to get a lift with a volunteer to the border with Germany and then walk across the border and then get a train to Berlin where she had to stay overnight and a flight to London. And her flight was cancelled twice before she managed to get on one. I mean, it's, so interrupt. it's just already a really distressing situation yeah. i mean what you know what what kind of impact does it, are you able to detect as having on the people that are trying to navigate um this situation you know th th this woman who's trying to travel from poland um navigating all sorts of hazards yeah it's making it a lot more stressful a lot more stressful and for, with poland when people go back they need to self-isolate for 14 days um, you know, Germany has closed borders with other countries, but the border with Poland is still open, so they could decide to close that border at some time. It's making it a lot more stressful. And the other thing that we've seen as ASN and Abortion Without Borders has seen um, is a huge increase in the number of people calling us because they've had sex and they're worried they might be pregnant. So those sorts of people don't usually call us as much, but people are having unprotected sex or having protected sex, but then getting very paranoid that they might get pregnant and they want to know well in advance what their options are if they are pregnant. Um, so that's really difficult. Um, and that's not, um, that's not normal. Um, so it's, it's a lot more complicated for women who are coming, who are in Poland or Malta than it was. Um, with Ireland, things are largely still um, quite similar. Um, there's not as many flights. Um, Northern Ireland, I think we're going to go on to talk about Northern Ireland. Um, obviously, things have changed there quite quickly. Um, well, I mean, it's taken far too long in terms of decades, but um, in the past few weeks, things have changed really quickly, and Rachel will be better equipped to talk about that than me. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, we always say that if you live in a country where abortion is restricted or illegal, what happens when you make abortion um, illegal or restricted is women who have money have options and women who don't have money have babies that they don't want and can't afford or are forced to do dangerous things. So we exist to kind of level that playing field and help give poorer women resources and information. But at the moment, the thing that's limiting us from helping people isn't resources and isn't information, it's travel restrictions. 
Yeah. And it's so really that's one more obstacle and it's really showing up the fact that, you know, if you live in a country like that all the time, um, you know, things are hard, but you know, you've got options at the moment, you've got far fewer options. And all, but also as Rachel said, it's become much more complicated for women in the UK as well. So it's showing that these, we can't take these things for granted. No, absolutely not. And it's really interesting that that point you made, um, which, you know, okay, maybe stupidly made me smirk a little bit about Christmas sex or whatever, but actually um, it highlighted for me um, how some of the things that are happening in response to this COVID crisis are connected and creating all sorts of other problems. And, um, you know, it's, it's no surprise to anybody on this call that we've been campaigning really hard to to highlight the, the perils faced by um, women who are potentially trapped with abusive partners because the lockdown situation means there's absolutely no respite, right? And yeah. um, I, I, think, I don't think it's too far-fetched at all to um, you know, acknowledge that sexual violence, um, people yeah. being raped in, the, in those circumstances where they're locked in with their uh, abusive yeah. partners is an inevitable terrible dire consequence of this situation which obviously um, yeah. potentially yeah. yields the kind of um consequences that uh your organizations are set up to respond to yeah or you know women not being able to access contraception we've already heard about um i just saw someone popped up saying coercion exactly the you know coercion in terms of sex as reproductive coercion of the partner withholding um contraception there's already a global issue with condom shortages and um, all of these things that, um, you know, we're all thinking about because it's what we care about and we're, you know, uh, committed to supporting, supporting people who are affected by it. And, but it's not what most people are thinking about in the middle of a pandemic. But yeah. they're going to have huge impacts. And we're also, I don't know about you, Rachel, at BPAS, but we're pretty confident that once the lockdown is lifted and once travel restrictions um, are lifted, we're going to see a backlog of um, people who've wanted an abortion for a while, who've become pregnant, but who weren't able to get one because they weren't able to travel. And hence, they're going to be further along in their pregnancy. Um, and abortions at later gestations are um, harder to come by and also a lot more expensive. Yeah, I mean, that's we're expecting as well. I think obviously for women who are en entitled to NHS care, there's the cost factor isn't a problem for them. Um, but I think that in terms of, I think as abortion, as with any other kind of medical care, we're seeing a decline in the number of women that are coming to things where they have to go to a clinic. So I think the things I've seen that I found most interesting recently are things like uh, the number of admittances to A&E for stroke has gone down by 60%. And that's not because the number of people having a stroke has gone down by 60%. It's because people are too scared to go to hospital. And I think that's very much what we're seeing with all medical care, including abortion. So mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing a lot fewer women at the moment who are, you know, um, maybe between 10 and 15 weeks. But our expectation, I think, as, as Ruth has said, is that those women will then present to us later on. And it, abortion is widely available, but the later the later during the pregnancy you get, the more specialised it becomes and the fewer places that provide it. Once you get past 20 weeks, there are only, I think, about 11 sites in the UK that provide abortions at that stage, um, yeah. certainly surgical ab abortions at that stage. So there are very few doctors, the workforce is very small. So I think that, you know, if there are any women who are pregnant and are worried about attending now i can understand that but i think that you know it's it's much more important that you get in touch with abortion providers now to make sure that you're going to be able to get the care that you need rather than hoping that if you present at 18 weeks you'll be able to get an abortion because mm. unfortunately that may not be the case mm. and these, these are exactly you know going d dipping into the, the the politics of this now i mean this is exactly why um it's, in my view, is completely wrong that, number one, the war cabinet um, that's been established to kind of um, oversee the, the government's response to this um, is entirely male, uh, it only has male representation on it. And equally, um, SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, that um, is 
overseeing the kind of public health response. Well, I find it very troubling that it's very difficult to get any information about who the actual members of that group are. But mm. um, I'm, I'd, I'd wager that um, women aren't fairly represented on that group. And if they were, the kind of issues that um, you just said, it comes naturally for us to think about those things, not only because of the jobs we do, but because of the perspective on life and on the world that we have. There's a real, there's a real blind spot, and it's a blind spot that's going to have real-world consequences that, um, you know, don't just end when we reach the finish line of this crisis, that, mm -hmm. you know, play out beyond the crisis. So, there's, you know, never a dull moment, plenty for us to do and plenty for us all to keep doing. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on um, Northern Ireland, and uh, I mean, you know, Ruth, you of course chip in, but I'm just going to direct this initially at Rachel. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about the extraordinary decision you and BPAS took in, in partnership with Alliance for Choice to make free, safe and legal abortions available to Northern Irish women during the pandemic? And do you think this marks a bit of a turning point, a point of no return for Northern Ireland looking into the horizon? Uh, so I suppose I'll start, I'll go back a little bit. Um, what happened last year uh, was that the Westminster Parliament uh, had a vote in about July uh, and essentially made the decision that if the uh, Northern Ireland executive wasn't back in place by October, uh, the law on abortion in Northern Ireland would change. Uh, the law up until that point had been based on the same thing that is that underpins the law actually in England and Wales as well which is that having an abortion is a crime that carries a life sentence. That's for the woman, that's for the doctor. Um, the only exception to that is to preserve a woman's life, or um, I think in the colourful words of a 1938 court judgment, if it would leave her a mental or physical wreck to continue with the pregnancy. Wow, exact words. Um, yeah, exact <laughs> words. Um, so those, that means that in Northern Ireland in recent years, there's only been about 10 abortions every year. Um, at the same time, we've seen, you know, up to about a thousand women come over to England and many more that buy pills online. What changed in October is that that underlying law was removed, which meant that abortion was no longer illegal. Um, and what happened at the end of March is that new regulations came into force. So secondary legislation that the Northern Ireland office in London brought forward. And that actually brought forward a... It was a, I think it is an absolutely huge step forward. I think there are definitely shortcomings in, in the law as it's been written, but essentially it says that up until 12 weeks, you can have an abortion on request without providing a reason, that you only need one signature from a doctor, a nurse, or a midwife, uh, which is more generous in the UK, which is two doctors at any time. Um, beyond that, up to 24 weeks, um, along the same grounds as the UK. So, um, you know, if there's uh, it will damage your mental health or physical health. Um, and then beyond 24 weeks uh, to preserve the life or health of the woman and uh, in the, on the grounds of severe fetal abnormality, uh, severe fetal abnormality. So it's, you know, it's, it's gone from being an exceptionally restrictive law, um, one of the most restrictive laws in the world, to being one which is a lot more in keeping with the law here, but sort of, you know, best practice around the world. Unfortunately, what it didn't do was enable women to take both sets of pills at home. Right. Up until that, the regulations passed, BPAS had been providing care to women by posting them pills um, because there were, there were no laws specifically around abortion as long as we were abiding by you know, medical frameworks and the, the essential, the underlying laws around providing prescription medication, which we were because the Northern Ireland doctor was writing a prescription, we were consulting with the women, it was all fine, but once once those regulations came in on the 31st of March, that service had to stop. Um, I think we'd always known that at that point we wouldn't be in a there wouldn't be people in Northern Ireland to provide that service. But obviously, with COVID, that became a bigger issue because at that point we were expecting that women would still be able to carry on travelling to England. It would not be ideal, but it would be something that had happened for many many years in Northern Ireland. It was established was funded by the English government. We were organizing accommodation and flights for people. So in terms of, there wasn't any cost involved. It wasn't yeah. ideal because women were being forced to travel, but it was accessible. Um, unfortunately with COVID, flights stopped. 
people weren't allowed to leave their house, the number of ferries massively reduced. And what we were seeing were women essentially coming to us saying, I'm not allowed to leave my house. I, you know, I've, I've got a, a long history. I've taken immunosuppressant drugs. Uh, you know, I've got a child that has, and, you know, a few of them have got ch children with severe medical issues. Um, and those women that were able to travel were facing sort of a 12 hour tri trip each way and no hotels available when they came here. So you're looking at 12 hours, getting here, having either a surgical abortion or taking the pills. And because they don't have an address in England, they have to take both sets of pills at a clinic in England and then try and get back to the ferry before you start miscarrying and then 12 hours back. So, it, you know, it was a, a huge a huge undertaking for any women and we saw a massive drop off in the number of calls we were taking uh, from women in Northern Ireland. So we're contracted by the government to provide the number, so there's a central number that you call and we provide that service and we were seeing a huge drop off because women knew that they were going to be forced to travel and they just couldn't. So we made the decision last week um, that the only re reasonable thing that we could do um, so Alliance Choice actually made this decision slightly separately to us and they're not working with us, they're working with a couple of other organisations. But um, our decision was that we would be operating within the law, but we would be operating under the emergency provisions, which means that essentially in order to, it's immediately necessary to preserve the life or health of women in order to, uh, to provide an abortion. And that doesn't carry the restrictions on place or the restriction or any of the other restrictions of the Abortion Act, which means that you know, at that point you can post pills. And the doctor that we've got working for us in Northern Ireland is very, very clear that what she is doing is preventing grave permanent injury to the mental health of women that she's treating. So that's the situation that we're in. Um, that sort of around the same time, um, a lot of work had been going on behind the scenes to try and ensure that um, the chief medical officer would tell hospital trusts that they were legally able to provide services. So I think... At the moment, there are no services commissioned in Northern Ireland. So the way that we work is that clinical commissioning groups, your local groups of the NHS, commission service from us. So we have specific things for specific numbers of women and a specific payment attached to that. The way that it will be working in Northern Ireland um, could be like that, but I think more broadly, it could also fit within what hospitals already paid so you know you pay your gynecology unit a certain amount of money for their budget and then inside that budget they treat women the problem was that they weren't sure that they re would be operating inside the law because now that the Northern Ireland Assembly is back there's a lot of fear about what's going to happen because yeah. obviously you know you've got Arlene Foster breathing down your neck you've got the Attorney General who went on the radio about five years ago and said that abortion was akin to shooting a two-day-old baby in the back of the head. These are not people that are going to be in any way supportive of women being able to access essential health care. So I think that, you know, it's understandably, I think doctors and nurses were very worried in Northern Ireland, but we got a great, there was a great thing that came out from the chief medical officer last week saying that it, hospitals are perfectly entitled to provide care and what we do know now is that um, a group called Informed Choices Northern Ireland who used to operate as family planning association in Northern Ireland uh, are going to be providing a central number for women they're going to be providing counselling and that kind of stuff and they're going to be working with hospital trusts so women can access uh, abortions in Northern Ireland so the issue there is that because of the way the law works, women still have to attend a hospital clinic to take the pill. So they haven't yeah. got the thing that we got to let those women take the first pill at home. So we know that there are still going to be women that are in a situation where they can't leave the house, whether those are women with specific caring needs, whether they are symptomatic, um, whether they uh, are self-isolating. So for those women, they're definitely, you know, we're still there to provide them with service. Um, and we're hoping that in a other places women will be able to uh, access a Northern Ireland led service because I think that's what we've all been working towards you know it's Mary Stopes used to operate over in Northern Ireland as well and I think it's always helpful to be able to provi provide these things but really what we've always needed and what Northern Ireland's always needed is a Northern Irish led service yeah. so that they can provide for themselves as part of healthcare and I think that that is where we're heading towards. So we're a little bit closer to that. Yeah, well, that's see, that's something which 
I guess, is a positive that we, you know, should appreciate and, and acknowledge. But speaking of other positives, um, Ruth, I, I just, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what has been going on in Poland, um, because um, I, I mean, my understanding of what's been happening literally hot off the press in Poland is that a bill was brought forward that was going to result in um, a total ban on abortions. And it appears that um, they have very cynically done that deliberately at a time when it is much more difficult for women to protest. Now, I know ASN, as you already mentioned, has recently expanded its, its operations into Poland. I know you're connected to a lot of the people um, on the front lines there, but just could you give us a little overview of, of, of what's happened? Um, because, you know, from, from my understanding of it, it's, it's extraordinary as well, um, the scenes that, that, that took place in the last 24 hours in Poland mm. and, and the conclusion that we've got to at this point in time. What's going on? I will do my best. Um, so Poland is Poland's a really interesting place in terms of abortion. Um, until the early mid '90s, Poland had a very progressive abortion law, like many other um, former Soviet Union, like former communist countries. And then I think in 1993 or 94, the law changed, um, and that was because of um, more sort of right-wing populism and more cultural Catholicism. So the law in Poland as it stands is that um, abortion is legal only in cases of um, rape or incest or where there is a fatal fetal abnormality. And almost all of the abortions that are performed in Poland at the moment under that law are for the final reason for fatal fetal abnormality because as I think most people know, it's, it's notoriously difficult to prove rape. People don't like going through that process. Um, estimated that about a thousand abortions are performed each year in Poland um, under the fatal fetal abnormality um, reason. Um, but it's also estimated that about 150,000 abortions, um, people a year in Poland have an abortion, and only a thousand of those are legal. So, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's, you know, branches of the government in Poland, branches of um, the population who would like to completely ban abortion in all circumstances. Um, and they have tried this before. This isn't the first time. I think back in 2017, um, they had some protests that were known as like the Black Friday protests, where lots of people, um, huge numbers of people came out and protested against them. Um, and so the bill failed at that juncture um, and they retained um, abortion in cases of fatal fetal abnormality. Um, and as you say, Mandu, what they've done is they've tried, they, they're sort of trying to capitalize on people's attention being elsewhere, on people's attention being away from women's rights um, and away from reproductive rights, um, and to try and push this incredibly restrictive bill and law through, through the Polish parliament. Um, however, I don't think they counted on the ingenuity of activists um, because what's happened in the past, yeah, 24 hours or so is pretty amazing. Um, the you know, people in Poland have done amazing like virtual protests online. There's been a huge amount of solidarity online. Um, people have been protesting in socially uh, distant, uh, physically distant, appropriate ways. So <laughs> they've blocked the streets in the centre of Warsaw um, with cars rather than with um, human bodies and also protested two metres away from each other. Um, people were putting black umbrellas on their balconies and in the streets. Um, there's been a huge wave of protest and our, my understanding from our Polish partner is that at the moment um, it's been halted in its steps and has to go to a parliamentary committee. Um, that doesn't mean that um, it won't happen and it doesn't mean that the pressure is off. Um, in fact, it probably means that everyone needs to redouble, redouble the efforts, but in a way, um, you know, a government trying to sneak something like that in um, when they think everyone's uh, backs are turned, it's shown that actually people's backs aren't turned. And the reason people's backs aren't turned is because women's rights and access to abortion is just as, if not more important during a crisis than it was beforehand. Yeah, and, that's, and that is actually, as strange as it may seem to say this, I think that's hugely uplifting. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that's um, a real puzzle, you know, for people who 
um, our activists day in, day out is what does activism look like in the age of social isolation? And, and we've got an example now from Poland, yeah. an example that um, looks like it's, it's had an impact and looks like it's, it's contributed to preventing a terrible outcome from materializing. You know, so those of us who are um, a little anxious about how on earth we can defend our rights in these conditions, you know, we, we really um, can, I think, draw strength from what our siblings in uh, Poland have been to and, and also some of the, um, you know, the cunning approaches, Rachel, that you, you've you outlined that, that led mm. to, um, you know, the, the, the situation in Northern, Northern Ireland panning out as it, as it did. And, you know, linked to that, they were also debating um, today um, in Poland whether sex education should be banned and yeah. teachers who teach it to be put in prison. Alongside, yes. I just think I'll share this. So that's, so should abortion be banned? The sex education thing that I've just mentioned, as well as should Jewish Holocaust survivors be banned from demanding compensation? And should children be allowed to hunt? I mean, really what is going on? This, th th there are, there are <coughs> factions in that population that are really trying to seize the chaos of the crisis to pursue and push and promote their very, very sinister agendas. So um, uh, we, we have no choice, I think, but to remain really, really vigilant. Yeah. Um, we've got about politically, politically, briefly, I can tell you what's going on. Is that there's a presidential election in a couple of months. And uh, oh, yeah. unfortunately, the president, although he's not from the ruling party, very much relying on the right wings in order to, you know, essentially traditionalist Catholics and just the far right in order to win. So they essentially are pushing as much as they can, knowing that he doesn't have the political capital at the moment to oppose it. It's cynical in the extreme, but not unexpected from politicians. Yeah, certainly not. And I think we've got 10 minutes now before we take our little interlude, but just to try and weave all the things that we've discussed together, you know, a, a much more broad brush question. I mean, why, that links to the points we've just been discussing. Um, why do we think that attacks on, on women's reproductive rights seem to intensify during crises like this? I suppose, I mean, I think, I suppose it depends where you're looking because I think that it's, I think it can be easy to think that I know, I know that in other places that certainly is the case. I think that we can be really pleased actually with the with England, the UK and Ireland actually more generally that we, I think, increasingly actually have a very positive pro-choice sort of public voice. I think that politicians from our point of view are really beginning to understand, and I suppose this is our main aim, that not doing anything or you know pandering to the more conservative sort of anti-abortion groups isn't going to wash anymore that mm -hmm. there's a wider point of view and a wider uh, sort of I think political support for change and that doesn't just sit with the left wing it doesn't just sit with the Labour Party it doesn't just sit you know with groups like WEP I think it's it's a it's a much wider thing. I mean, when you look at national polling, including sort of the British Social Attitude Survey, about 70% of people believe that there shouldn't be a criminal penalty for abortion, which mm -hmm. is more liberal than the current law. More than 90% of people believe that abortion should be legal in some circumstances. And I think that with the new influx of MPs, that's actually what we're seeing as well. Even though I think a lot of people might think, oh, well, we've got a very conservative parliament. The thing to remember is that uh, abortion actually vote matter in Westminster as it is in in Holyrood and Cardiff um, and it, well I suppose not really in Stormont but um, I think that it's really important to remember that because it's a free vote matter changes to the demographics of Parliament when you get younger people in you know you're looking at a very very different situation when you're looking at people that were elected in 2019 compared to people that were first elected in 1992 or 1987. Mm -hmm view of the world is just very very different so I think I'm always I mean I'm not an optimistic person but I'd always <laughs> say I'm quite optimistic about the position that we're in I think politically in in um, Britain and I suppose increasingly actually in the UK as a whole I think when you look around the world 
I think it's what Ruth said. It's the idea that people think that people in the other way, that they're too busy fighting for survival to care about things like civil liberties and civil rights. And I think the answer is that's just not true. Quite frankly, people are worried about staying alive, but they're also all sat at home <laughs> with very little work to do, really hoping that they can do something that's bigger than themselves. And I think that that's really where sort of the civil rights campaigns come to the, come to the fore. Mm. Yeah, Ruth, what are, what are your thoughts just before we wrap up for our little break? Uh, broadly, I completely agree with everything that Rachel said. I think, um, I do think there's something in a crisis. Um, I wonder if there's a bit of um, some people's kind of reptilian brain that kicks in or maybe reptil might, reptilian might be the wrong part of the brain. But I think there's people, as Rachel was just talking about, there's people who are looking for meaning and looking for ways to be active and looking for purpose beyond self. Um, and then there's other people who are thinking about survival and survival to them means um, controlling other people, controlling choices, controlling women's bodies and protecting like the survival of the species by ensuring, you know, the stuff that we get on Twitter from trolls, the stuff that we get, you know, uh, is next level and it actually this is interesting has really escalated in the past few weeks um we've had a lot more unpleasant trolling on twitter than i we found had that as well i don't oh, yeah. know it's, i think that when we're talking about northern ireland particularly i've we've also had quite an increase in the number of letters sent to our clinics but i think that that might be because of the, obviously big plus side of the part of the lockdown people aren't allowed to stand outside our clinics and harass yeah. <laughs> So I think my personal favourite bit was a couple of weeks ago when in Streatham um, someone called the police on someone that was stood outside because there were like three of them, not two metres apart, standing outside doing some non-essential praying and approaching oh. him. So <laughs> learned the sling your huck book, I think, is really what the police went with. Yeah. We've got more yeah. Okay, so there are these hidden, there are these hidden, hidden benefits. Um, but yeah, I wonder if there's a bit of sort of people going into like a reptilian brain, must protect the species, paternalistic, patriarchal, you know, must control women because we can't control anything else. Um, you know. I think they also see it as an opportunity, don't they? It's yeah. like, I think this is particularly true in America where they will take absolutely anything to try and get to their political end. Yeah. And I think that American politics is particularly nasty, vicious, and with absolutely no redeeming qualities, quite frankly. Um, and I think that really this is just another example of that. Yeah, I think the I'm definitely in the camp which thinks opportunism is is a, is a strong factor here because um, crises always present opportunities to change things. But yeah. in the when you're talking about an issue like this, it's people on both sides of um, you know, the conundrum that are gonna try and seize the opportunity to uh, pursue their goal and their aims. So yeah. this crisis in a way is no different and um, it just underscores why we've gotta be vigilant. I mean, I know that polling suggests people in, in um, the UK are on board with the perspective we all share, but then there are powerful people behind the scenes who must have lent on um, some of Matt, Matt Hancock's people and got them to kind of get cold feet before the decision obviously settled back to um, where we um, all hoped and wanted right. to be. Yeah. <laughs> I think what I'll do though is wrap up uh, for, for our break now, just because if we start another strand of conversation, we're all quite talkative people, uh, we're gonna miss the clap for carers. So we will resume at 10 past eight. Um, so please, you know, get a refreshment. I don't know, have a comfort break, um, make some noise for uh, NHS workers, social care workers, everyone on the front line. And I'll see you back here, 10 past eight, and we'll be able to take some of the questions I hope you've been putting through um, on the chat as we've been talking. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mandu. We'll be back. Yeah, see you, see you back here. All right, we're all back. Fantastic. Um, and there's been a, a, you know, very few people have dropped off. It's brilliant that lots of people have rejoined the call um, and sent in questions. I'm so sorry that we aren't gonna be able to get to all of them, um, but uh, we'll figure out what to do uh, 
um, with the questions we're not able to tackle afterwards. Uh, right, I, I think it is really important that we took a little interlude to show support uh, for our frontline workers. Um, we can do that. We can clap for them uh, while simultaneously acknowledging um, that applause or badges for that matter oh, are no substitute for being fairly paid, for safe working conditions, for the testing, for PPE, for all the things that they need and deserve as they shoulder um, the burden of, of guiding us through and getting us through this crisis. Thanks so much to everyone who joined tonight and rejoined after that little break. Um, we've had a fantastic turnout and we'll be continuing um, with this series with regular conversations that amplify important perspectives, that pass the mic to women whose points of view all too often go unheard or are ignored completely. So we'll be examining issues as well in the, in the next few weeks, certainly, that um, are really important as this crisis starts to uh, evolve and progress. Um, it would be, if you'd like to, you know, be first to hear about um, the forthcoming events that we'll be doing, please like and follow us on social media. Um, and uh, the handles for that will be posted, I believe. One of the team will be posting them on the chat right now in case um, you're not sure. And we're on, we're on all the different channels and the content's obviously slightly different on each of those channels. Um, and you know, even better, why don't you just sign up and become a member of the Women's Equality Party? And I promise you that you will get more than a badge. You will actually get a badge, but you'll get more than a badge um, as a member. So give that some thought. Um, Rachel and Ruth, uh, please feel free also to share your social media handles so that our audience can follow and connect with you um, if they'd like to, and just use the chat to do that. Um, so that people can track you down, and I mean that in the best possible way, uh, track you down, stay in touch, and, and connect and potentially collaborate with you. Um, right, I think what we need to do now is get back to business, and um, what that means is having a look at some of the questions that uh, our audience sent through. So, well, there's lots of interesting stuff here. Okay, um, let's start with something that actually doesn't really link directly to um, any of the things that we, we discussed in, in part one. Um, and it's about a very specific group of, of women. Um, do you know anything about uh, whether um, there are plans in place for uh, people to access abortions um, when they're either uh, been, you know what, I think I might have just talked myself out of this question. Tell you, let me tell you is what the question was. Is this the one about women that are COVID positive? Because no. I've got an answer. Oh, that's, right. a great, that's a great question. Oh, yeah. but no, let me, you know what, let, let me just go with it. And then I think you'll see when I finish the question why I might have talked myself out of it. The question was, is there anything that you know of being done about access to abortions in prisons? Yeah, so um, we, so BPAS as an organization does treat women in prison. So we've got some good relationships with a number of prisons. We also have a contraceptive nurse that goes in and talks to women about their particular needs because what we know is that women overwhelmingly are on very short sentences and that quite often they'll go back out into, um, into the community and when they're released, the rate of unplanned pregnancy is actually very, very high. And part of that mm -hmm. is women not having access to the contraceptive services that they need. So we have a nurse that goes in and talks to women uh, in Bronzefield Prison to talk to them about what they, you know, what their needs and wants are and, and what we can provide to them. Uh, but we do also treat women that come out of prisons and we're working uh, with, I think it's with Public Health England at the moment to get some good indicators sort of out there on uh, how long women have to wait, what their policies are, you know, because um, I think that some of the issues particularly are around um, what kind of abortions women in prison have access to. So obviously they can't take pills back to the prisons for themselves to take. So either they have a medical that's on the site or they'll have surgicals. And if there's surgicals, there's questions about, you know, 
whether the guard stays with them, whether handcuffs remain on, those kind of issues as well. So um, at the moment, I don't believe that anything has changed with prison access. We're still running clinics right. um, and our clinics are still open. So prisoners tend not to come to our smaller clinics and our smaller clinics are the ones that have shut and we're consolidating our staff in bigger centres. And those centres are the ones that treat women from prison. So unfortunately, they're still required to travel because obviously there's there's not the expertise in the prison to provide pills directly uh but we are still treating those women okay so they're pregnant at the time of being you know sent to prison or maybe getting yeah. pregnant while they're inside prison um, so broadly i would say that they're women that are pregnant before they enter prison yeah. um, obviously you know it's it's with the the short sentences or women that have been for instance recalled um, so people who um, have been recalled on remand, that kind of stuff. So um, there are, I, yeah, I mean, it's mostly, as far as, I, as far as I know, there are not a huge number of women who, you know, present to us having become pregnant while they're in prison. It's mostly uh, got pregnant on the outside. Right. Okie dokie. Thank you so much. Um, the next one, and there's, there's I, I had a quick glance at the chat and um, I've had, I've had some, um, comments come through to me directly on WhatsApp, people who are on um, the call. And it seems that there's a real appetite for people um, to get involved, to, to, to support, to um, help and, and, and enable the work that, you know, your organizations and other organizations are doing. So what kind of support that is specifically needed for women who need abortions during this COVID period? And how can people that um, want to help and, and, and make a difference, how can they do that? How can they support um, what you're trying to do? I'll start with you, Ruth. I'm going to be honest and say that right now, the best thing people can do is donate to us. Um, we have a lot of volunteers. We're very much a volunteer driven organization. We've got about 90 active volunteers. Um, so I Social media is run by volunteers. Uh, we have loads of volunteers who help with fundraising. Our helpline is staffed by volunteers. Um, we have a load of volunteer hosts who will host um, clients when they come to the UK in their homes um, if they need to stay overnight. But that's actually on hold at the moment. Um, and we're only putting people who need to stay overnight in hotels um, in order to prevent the spread of infection and kind of adhere to social distancing social distancing rules um, I think at the moment um, you know people can yeah donate to us or to other organizations um, if you're you know really interested in how women are accessing early medical abortion um, you could look at donating to someone like women help women um, in terms of volunteering it's a little bit trickier at the moment obviously because in-person volunteering is very limited um, I think uh, there will be more scope in the future. I, I was looking through the chat and I saw someone had asked about whether we think there'll be more demand for abortions in future. Um, there may well be. I think as Rachel and I both said, there'll probably be a spike. Um, also, you know, we're going to go into a massive deep recession um, and um, people who already have children might not want any more. Um, as you know, we've all said um, a lot of, women who have abortions, most women who have abortions already have other children. Um, people's incomes are gonna be um, declining um, and you know there will be more demands. So it'll be about supporting organizations so they can keep going and get through this. Um, you know, that's what we've got to make sure is that we're here and other people who um, help women who need abortions are still there at the other side of this crisis, which is, you know, what we're really focusing on. And for us at the moment, that's about financial sustainability. Sorry to be boring. <laughs> no, it's the reality. I mean, it's, it's the women's sector across the board is always hustling and struggling and trying to keep afloat on a shoestring. So yeah, I totally, exactly. totally get that. It's the same, frankly, for us. Yeah. Um, Rachel, yeah. um, what, 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 what do you think? Um, are there any kind of specific needs women who need abortion have right now in the context of COVID and, and, and can people who want to help support and help in any way? So I think that in the way that we provide services, we're uh, the, the vast majority of our funding comes from the NHS. So we're paid for the services that we provide. Women aren't charged for the services that we provide. The only women, um, and, and I suppose those outside, so 
anyone that's eligible for NHS care is eligible for free treatment with us. Uh, anybody that gets in touch with us and says, I'm not eligible for NHS care, but I can't afford to pay, uh, we have a policy of not turning any women away either. So we have a charity. <laughs> right um so we we treat women um as well even if they're not eligible for nhs care so in terms i suppose it's we're a professional organization so we don't have the same kind of volunteer base that um ruth has we do have a group called friends of bpass um and that is that does involve uh, fundraising as well but we it's essentially a small monthly uh, payment and that goes towards our advocacy work and that's the work that we'll do you know talking to government ministers sending them stuff working with MPs working with members of the House of Lords to get stuff done so I think that's really in terms of what we do the best thing that you can do and our website there is friends of the .org, um, and you can join us there and then we'll keep you up to date with all the stuff that we are up to um, I suppose the one other thing that I would say is I am currently in the process of trying to get Airbnb to recognize us as one of our uh, sort of key worker things. So if anybody has an Airbnb or a few Airbnbs, ideally that are free in places like London or Merseyside or Manchester that are currently not being used and that you might be able to let use exclusively. So they'd have to be ones where it's not just a room, it's a whole property. Um, for women that are accessing later abortion services and so have to travel, that would be great because I know that we're struggling at the moment to find that kind of accommodation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that is really tangible. I mean, I think um, to just wind things up now, um, reflecting back on uh, the crisis and, and um, how the crisis... Before you my answer, yeah. one question that I saw on the chat. Oh, yeah, 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 go for it. So, uh, one of the questions was, what are the plans for women that are test positive for COVID? And the answer is that we're working... Uh, BPAS has a an organize, uh, sort of a, a thing that we do called specialist placements. So there are some women that we are not able to treat, women that need to be treated in hospital. Those are women with things like underlying heart conditions, uncontrolled epilepsy, things that means they need to be in a hospital where if they crash during a procedure, the help can be given to them. Um, and we are asking those specialist placement hospitals that provide to see whether they have isolation facilities to be able to provide to women that have COVID. This is broadly not a problem for women earlier on in pregnancy, but obviously if you're late on and you're very close to the legal limit, you may not be able to wait those two weeks. So there are hospitals that can do that. Um, and if any, you know, if anyone is worried about that, I just strongly recommend getting in touch with BPAS on our national line and we have that information to be able to help. Please put that in the chat at the very end so people just know what the national line is. Um, to sort of wrap us up, uh, I think, you know, it feels like it's been a long time, but it's probably fair to say that we're still in the prologue of this crisis. And, and one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, well, what do we want the epilogue to be? And from the point of view of your work, what do you hope uh, the aftermath of this crisis will bring? Uh, let's start with you, Ruth. Um, I think for me, it's already exciting that there's been a move to telemedicine, um, a move to more telemedicine and a move to an understanding that, um, you know, abortion with pills, early medical abortion is um, on the WHO's list of essential medicines. It's very safe. Um, women can manage it themselves very safely. Um, and that that can be done re remotely and doctors don't, you know, doctors can be involved over the phone or over the internet, but they don't need to be involved and it still works and it's still safe. I think that's really exciting. I think that could be something that we see in the, in the epilogue. Um, and also I think something else that probably we already know is happening is more people um, self-managing um, abortions with the MA beyond the end of the first trimester which again is also really important. We know that that's effective, just there haven't been um, tons of clinical trials. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, yeah, hopefully is something that we'll see more of and have more understanding of. Um, and also ultimately maybe even more access to safe abortion in general. Um, because I think depending on, you know, depending on how long this lasts, um, and I think we all know this isn't going to be two or three months, this is going to be, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and I think, um, 
depending on how things play out, we could ultimately actually see a move for more understanding of why um, safe abortion services are important and why abortion should be, as we always say, free, safe, legal, local. Um, you know, there's very few places where it's all four of those things. Yeah. Um, but um, actually, there could be a move where actually we end up seeing a positive change in that. That's what I'd hope for, is those things. Better telemedicine, more self-management of abortion beyond 12 weeks, and more safe abortion in general. Thank you. What about you, Rachel? So I think for quite a long time, BPAS has been campaigning to decriminalise abortion. So as I said earlier, let me do a quick spiel now. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the current law in England and Wales, and in fact Scotland, is that abortion is still illegal. What the abortion act does is not make it not illegal it provides certain exemptions so as long as you see two doctors as long as you're in a licensed premises or a hospital as long as you're before 24 weeks you're not committing a crime but what it does mean is if you buy pills online you are committing a crime and that's a very different thing to places like poland where if you're a woman that buy, buys pills online you're not committing a crime so and that's the same is true in america as well that you know selling pills may be illegal but actually buying pills is not because criminalizing women is seen as a step too far. And unfortunately, based on an 1861 law under the Offences Against the Person Act, that's not where we are in uh, Great Britain. So our argument for a long time has been that we need to get rid of that underlying law. That underlying law needs to go and we need to treat abortion like the healthcare procedure that it is. So essentially, there are no specific laws for transplants. There are no specific laws for heart, open heart surgery or for that matter for, you know, getting some cough medicine from your GP, but there are for abortion. I think that it treats it in the wrong way. It treats it as a, as a criminal procedure that needs to be stopped, that women need to be, you know, controlled their way out of as if women haven't been having abortions since the beginning of time. And I think that what we actually need to do is spend more time treating abortion as a medical procedure. So using the regulation, using the laws that surround all medical treatment and not use it as a specific thing that needs specialist law. Um, and I think that from a really basic level, what that would have done with this is that when the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Royal College of Midwives said, actually, you know what, to get through this, we really need to be able to treat women at home. That would have just happened at the drop of a hat because, you know, it's up to them. They're the doctors. They're doing what's best for women. It wouldn't be waiting and keeping your fingers crossed and hoping and praying that Matt Hancock might eventually make the right decision. So I think that's really what we need. We need less political and more about women's health. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect note to wrap up on uh, because it actually segues beautifully to um, something that I want to make sure everyone who's on the call looks out for. Um, you are going to get an email from us soon, which will have details about our campaign to remove the requirement for two doctors to, to give permission for women to access abortions, particularly at this time. We're going to try and be opportunistic about the fact that the, the, the health services is buckling and struggling. And so this is, this is the moment to actually take that incremental step which hopefully gets us closer to where we all want to end up uh, by removing that requirement so you'll be hearing um, uh, about us from that you'll be hearing about our campaign and what we're going to do what we propose to do over the period ahead to make um, this happen I mean as much as there are so many things that are under threat I do think this this whole crisis is whole situation provides fertile ground for us to find our power for us to um, support each other and for us to um, you know hold the line where, where, where some of the stuff we fought for is under threat but also make advances even if they're small advances towards the goals that we're really really uh, hoping um, will materialize um, you know as we go forward. So there'll be another one of these, of course, and um, the topic for the next one, we haven't got a date confirmed yet for that because we're speaking to different guests, is going to be all about the scourge of male violence against women and girls in the context of um, the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, as I said, you can sign up um, to get info from us via our website, you can join us, you can follow us on social media, and I think we're wrapping up just on time. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Ruth and Rachel. Really, really appreciate it. 
it means a lot. I'm really grateful that you took the time out of your evening to be part of this conversation. Um, let's keep the faith. Let's keep the fire burning. Let's keep supporting each other because the post COVID-19 worst case scenario is, is not inevitable, but it is inevitable if we don't, you know, keep the pressure up where and how and when we need to. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Bye. Ruth. Bye now. Bye.